Well, hello there, and welcome to this week's portrait painting video. Uh, welcome to the start of a self-portrait. If you would like to see a list of the colors that I used today, please go ahead and check the description box of this video for a list of the oil colors that I used. Now, before getting started, I should mention that the painting from last week will be completed in a future upload. It's just this week in particular, I will be starting the self-portrait as you're seeing here. I'm working on an 11 by 14 inch uh, wooden panel that was acrylic primed and then oil toned a neutral gray tone. I'm using a brownish color to draw. It is a combination of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. And the brushes that I'm using are bristle brushes. This is a size two filbert brush that you're seeing me use. It is uh, by the brand Silver Brush. It is a Silver Brush Grand Prix size two filbert. And I like to work with big, simple shapes uh, for the beginning. And I'm gonna be going right into color. As you're seeing, I'm just doing a very simple uh, umber drawing, as I would call it before, but now you can just call it a very basic block-in with that brownish mixture that I said before. And I'm working from a mirror, though you can't see the mirror. Like I said, I'm not going to be putting photo references in the editing of these videos. Instead, I'll be guiding you along the process of how I paint, working uh, strictly from life, working from nature. And I want to make a point of this as well uh, because I want everyone to um, work from life, work from nature as much as possible. It's really one of the best ways to learn. And you always have a mirror. You, you always have yourself. So um, utilize the mirror as much as possible. And like I said, I'm using a mirror. I have my head turned towards uh, three-quarter, closer to profile. Uh, the beginning of the block in is usually pretty messy. Uh, I'm trying to cover a more uh, basic sense of the shapes, you know, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth could all be moved around. Everything is pretty free and nimble, so I'm able to make a lot of adjustments as I work. The idea behind this uh, start notice it's going to be an ala prima style start is to get the canvas or the panel should should i say the panel covered with color and to start the uh, basically the big form uh, modeling and to develop the painting with color so so to speak i will be composing in color now you're seeing in some areas i use more ultramarine blue which makes the brownish color a little bit darker in other areas, I use a little bit less of it, and it's a little bit warmer towards the Sienna. And now I switch to a size 4 uh, Filbert Extra Long Silver Brush Grand Prix. This is a bristle brush. Again, it holds quite a ton of paint, so it allows me to go ahead and work right into the lights. And like I said, it's going to be an Ala Prima style start, so I'm working directly with the light tones and I'm using a combination of yellows, reds, and greens to get this kind of skin tone mixture. For more exacting color um, tutorials and things like that please check my online classes out but for uh, the time being here that the neutral tone of the panel is helping me out because my lights look like lights, my dark looks like look like darks excuse me, my warms look warm and my cools will look relatively cool although gray is closer towards the blue anyway uh, but with portraiture it does help to have kind of a cooler tone at times so there is no medium being used it's just paint and solvent and for a solvent i'm using spike lavender oil so spike lavender is my solvent it is uh, uh, classically uh, thought of as a very non-toxic solvent to use if you don't want to have the health hazards in oil painting uh, that can come with using too much uh, turpentine or petroleum distillates then spike lavender is a good resource uh, for you that being said though the spike lavender is being used sparingly only when i really need to thin out paint such as the drawing color i used more spike lavender than say the lights Now the lights are a little more towards the um, the cooler yellow-orange 
kind of grayed outside and I'm going to be working right into those lights. So I covered the light one flat tone, at, at least one primary flat tone as quickly as possible. As you're seeing now, the shadows have been blocked in. The head is very generic. Um, it is a little bit difficult, I will say, when you're working um, from a mirror and posing because you really have to memorize your pose. Like I said, you're not going to see me in the mirror here, so all you're really seeing is um, how the painting is developing. But when you're working on a self-portrait, number one, please don't use a photograph. Use the mirror. I know it's a very difficult thing to do at times, but use the mirror. Trust me, it's going to help you tremendously. Now, when you're working from a mirror, you have to remember your pose. So every time you turn your head and look at the mirror, you have to move your head because you're moving your head to look at the mirror. And then you're looking at the palette, so you move your head somewhere else to look at the palette. So that's why you really need to remember your pose. So I told myself I'm going to be three-quarter closer to profile without a head tilt. Usually I'll paint with a tilt. This time I decided to omit the tilt. And so once all of these shapes have started to develop, as you're seeing here, it's really not as difficult anymore because the big shapes have been laid in. So I can work more freely with the uh, division of planes. Putting in a little bit of a warmer, closer to the pinkish side uh, tone for the cheeks is the way that I start. I won't be telling you specific color mixtures, but I'll be telling you specific hues and color relationships based on hues. So a little bit closer to the pinkish side, but grayed out um, for the side plane of the maxilla next to the nose, uh, which is, again, the plane right next to the nose. And then a little bit closer to the greenish brown towards the eye sockets, closer to the greenish brown with less saturation. Remember, color has a hue, value, saturation. So even though I'm using a lot of colors in my palette uh, these days, I'm still trying not to make the saturation too strong everywhere. So one of the the pitfalls of having an extended palette like what I have is that everything can tend to get a little too bright, a little too saturated. So know your complementaries and cross your complementaries whenever you want to bring down saturation as opposed to just going straight into gray. And the background has a little bit of dioxazine purple. It has a tiny bit of phthalo turquoise and a little bit of cadmium orange for a nice brownish cross complementary uh, mixture. So when you have an extended palette, such as the one I'm using, you can really get a nice variety of neutrals and browns that you wouldn't be able to get with a more limited palette. And accompany that with working from life, Seeing big shapes of color, working with color relationships in this way for a portrait is not easy. Uh, in fact, it is easier to go in with a very careful finished drawing and then trace the outlines and then build up the darks through transparent layers and washes, just like the classical approaches. Um, I teach my students that method to begin, and then I... Uh, you know, take my students further and further towards Alla Prima, which is a more efficient way, albeit more difficult, but more efficient way to compose a picture. And over time, working this way with color and big shapes and large planes ends up being more freeing in the long run. Now you're seeing how I put information in and then I take it out. So at this point in the in the recording, I definitely placed my right eye, or I guess left since it's um, a mirror, but in any case, I put the eye in the wrong spot that you're seeing right there. I quickly sit, sit back and realize it's in the wrong spot and I take it out. As you see, I put the eye in, I, I sat back a little bit and took it out and raised it a little bit. This is one of the ways that you can 
move and compose with color. I said, forget it. I'm not going to go into that kind of detail yet. And let me go figure out the uh, color for the side of my cheekbone. So I used a little bit of a more neutral pink towards the cooler side. Not so bright. I don't want to have a bright saturated color. So I went with more of a neutral uh, pink. Closer to the greenish, but not quite as green as, say, the the reflected light on the shadow. Also know your surface that you're working on. Since this is the start of a painting that I'm going to continue to develop, I don't want to start on uh, automatically start on say a cotton canvas. I would prefer either to start on an oil prime linen or a wooden panel. And today I just went with the wooden panel. For the mixture of the hair, in particular the facial hair, I used a little bit of uh, a Williamsburg color that I like to use, which is uh, cinnabar green light, a little bit of dioxazine purple, um, dioxazine purple and its complementary cadmium orange gives me a nice, um, strange looking neutral, but oddly naturalistic looking um, color for the hair. And of course, the grayish tone of the background plays a role. You see the background shining through in some of the colors, which is why it's nice to uh, plan the color that you're going to have for the tone of your surface. And cover quickly so that you can work with large areas of color. And now you're seeing the big shapes are starting to become more and more refined. So the light that I'm using is an LED light, a little bit cooler LED light, closer to daylight. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of subtle coloring. It's not a bright orangey fluorescent light. It's more of a cool natured light. So in this way, working with big shapes, you can also get something that um, some artists refer to as the light key, which is the characteristic of the light. When you're working with skin tones, it's very complicated. So maybe doing this uh, with still life, trying to describe the nature of the light is probably the better way to learn how to use color to describe the characteristics of light. That is to describe the light key. Now when you're working with an extended palette, it's important to arrange it in a way similar to a color wheel, which becomes very intuitive over time. Of course, at first it's very difficult, but over time it becomes more intuitive. Schools that use this type of color palette um, are Studio and Cominati in Philadelphia. And I really don't know any others other than Studio and Cominati. There used to be, if there still is, I don't know, a school called um, uh, Cape Cod School of Art originating from the teachings of Charles Hawthorne, uh, William Merritt Chase, of course, long in the past, and then Henry Hinchy, who taught uh, Nelson Shanks and many, uh, many other artists you can find this kind of information on extended color palettes um, if you search in the internet. But for the most part, think about the colors as relationships. That's the best advice I can give you. Think about colors in relation to one another instead of trying to think too much into how to, say, match a color. And even still, at this point, I had the eye in the wrong spot, but rather than jumping in the details and trying to render everything, um, going in with large and bold brush marks, you see the light plane, light most facing plane for the side of the nose. I'm now pushing that shape upwards a little bit. Inevitably, it pushes the nose, the nasal bone up, excuse me, it pushes the nasal bone up, which then moves the eye socket automatically. So if you work the large structures of the face, try not to invent much, but try to observe from the periphery, especially when you're working from a live model. And you'll be able to get very complex proportions just by working with very large, simple shapes.
Now, when your subject is wearing glasses, like I am, I would recommend actually taking the glasses, putting the glasses in and then taking them out periodically. But don't intentionally take them out. Sometimes you just end up brushing over the glasses, which is perfectly fine. Glasses can be painted in less than a couple minutes. You really don't need to do much for glasses. Just highlights, middle tones, dark darks, and cast shadows is pretty much all you need for glasses, which is why I recommend just putting them in early. And if you end up painting over them, sometimes you'll see me do that. That's fine. Just paint right into it. Put the glasses back every once in a while just to check your drawing, but don't stress over them. Now, as this is more of a walkthrough than it is a tutorial or a lesson in that matter, this is not meant to be a lesson in any sort. Uh, the way that I guide my online students, again, if you want to check that out, just check out um, the description box of this video or uh, just type in patreon.com um, slash artists and you can check out uh, some of the content, or at least you can see some of what I have available, in, including live lessons and, and such. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is paint as much as you can from nature. Please do not limit yourself to painting from photo references strictly just because we're in a pandemic. We always have mirrors. I'm telling you, we always have mirrors. We can look at the mirror and paint ourselves. It doesn't even have to be a large mirror. I'm using, I think it's like a 18 by 24 inch, very inexpensive mirror that I'm using. As long as it's not distorted, uh, it's not like a, like a funny mirror in any way, it's perfectly fine. Do as many of these as possible. Painted sketches, uh, uh, you can work with any media that you like, but the more that you relate shapes from nature, the more that you get to observe nature, the stronger and the stronger your skill set will become. Now with my online students, I guide them through uh, step by step. So it's not edited in this way. It's a step by step uh, live talking type of edit. But for you, those of you at home, definitely I very much encourage you to get a mirror and paint as many self-portraits as you can if you are interested in pushing your skill sets further and further. For instance, the light on my facial hair, even though I don't have much facial hair, uh, the light on my facial hair looks closer to the greenish. Um, it has much more vibrance to it than if someone were to take a picture of me. If you were to take a picture of me, you wouldn't see, say, that the below my mouth is a little bit closer to the I want to say violet. It's a very weird thing when you start to relate colors to one another. And like I said, if it's too complex, go ahead and do still life. Still life is an excellent way to learn how to manage color relationships. And since this is the first sitting for this painting, I want the background to be fully covered. It's a dark bluish, closer to the violet. When I say violet, I use that term very, very um, sparingly because it's maybe a slight bit violet, but not very violet. Like I said, now you're seeing the colors start to become much more complex. I don't want to have highly saturated colors everywhere, nor do I want to have a very basic, uh, straight out of the tube, uh, looking earthy colors everywhere just because that's, you know, something that's easier to do. What I want is to use more complex uh, colors and match the relations, not the colors. I'm trying to get the relations of the colors as close as possible, not match any one color in isolation. And in another sitting, like I said, next week I'll very likely return to the one other portrait that I was working on. Um, but when I do return to this painting, when you see this painting again, it will most certainly be completely dry. And I'll very likely just start working uh, opaque paint into opaque paint once again. But for the first sitting, the intention was to get the big composition mapped out, 
to get the big color relationships in check. Um, not any tiny little details uh, just yet, but set the stage for the future shapes to um, be built upon. Now, as I was saying before, when it comes to color, you don't need to use all of the colors that you're going to see in the description box of this video. I believe it's 22, uh, 22 or 23 different colors. I'm picking and choosing, adding and subtracting colors as I seem, as as I deem necessary for the sake of experimentation. But you can very easily use the Zorn palette to get. Uh, well acquainted with mixing colors, but after you spend enough time with a limited palette, uh, I highly recommend to move into more extensive palettes until you find the perfect palette that works for you. But something like the Zorn palette is perfectly fine, though it would lack the, uh, I want to say, the subtleties that can be obtained in a more extensive palette when it comes to skin tones. Now you're seeing some last minute adjustments to the light key, meaning the condition of the light. So I'm pushing the light on the lip a little bit closer to the greenish. Notice it started off really warm and started being, I started keying the light towards the cooler end of the color spectrum. Now the drawing, the likeness is decent, but it's not excellent it will be continued to i will continue to push the likeness though that's not what these videos are about these videos are about painting and not copying uh, but i do give myself room to continue to push and develop the likeness in future sittings which is why i try not to paint as tight or as uh, you know as uh, super sharp everywhere i try to leave as many soft edges because they're easier to to be to build on top of. Now as this week's video is starting to draw to a close, I should mention that I do switch from bristle brushes to synthetic brushes. Uh, bristle brushes can carry a ton of paint very easily and when you mix with opaque paint, when you mix with a lot of paint, you have much more of a color range and much more uh, versatility in color. Switching to the synthetics is mainly just to add small amount of paint at a time and to soften edges. That's why you saw me switch to the synthetic brush towards the end. The synthetic brushes are uh, Qualita brushes uh, by Creative Mark Qualita Filbert size 4 and size 2. Those don't really matter as much. You can use any kind of acrylic or watercolor brushes. Uh, they tend to handle very similar Albeit, in the beginning, the bristle brushes that I used were um, very useful, in my opinion, in carrying a lot of paint. No one is paying me to tell you that, um, so when I say that those bristle brushes were very useful, it is um, because I really just want to tell you they were very useful for carrying a ton of paint. And now for the last few adjustments, it's just a, a bunch of soft edges that I'm pushing. Notice that there's not a large uh, range of values. There's not a lot of values. Actually very few values. A lot of color variation and edge variation goes into the mix here. And a few more little adjustments, and this one is going to be ready to let dry and continue at a different time. And just like I'm advising you to paint from nature, meaning paint from life as much as possible, also I would advise you to paint for tomorrow, or should I say paint for the next sitting. So always leave yourself softer edges because those are easier to work over top of. And always just remind yourself that you're just getting started and there's no rush. Give yourself as much time as needed in your paintings. That being said, 
If you would like to take online classes with me, including live streams, please check out patreon.com slash artist. I wish you the very best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next one.